go ahead and get started. So we're very fortunate to have uh, Professor Jim Fuller from Caltech join us today. And he is not going to talk to us about gravitational waves, but a different exciting phenomenon, gravity waves. So <clears throat> something interesting about Jim, he's an avid hiker, and I think quite a few of us I know here like to hike as well. Uh, I certainly do. But he's hiked <clears throat> probably more than the majority of us. He's hiked, what, 67 out of 70 of the tallest peaks in the continental United States. And yet, he has not done Mount Washington. So I think we need to encourage him to come back and, and hike Washington. At any rate, let's, uh, let's, let's hand it over to you for an exciting talk. OK, thanks, Don. Thanks for coming, everybody. It's really great to be back here. This is only my second time at Harvard. I've had my first mug for like six years now. I've gotten a lot of mileage out of it, so it's good to finally be back. Uh, today, I want to talk to you about gravitational uh, waves, actually, non-gravitational waves. I want to talk to you about gravity waves, which I think are actually much more exciting. So you've probably heard about detection of gravitational waves. I'm here to tell you today, the Nobel Committee got it all wrong. <laughs> all interesting science is in gravity waves, not these just boring outcomes of general relativity. So I think actually, there's a good case to be made for learning a lot about gravity waves. Part of the reason for that is that they are almost everywhere in astrophysics. So basically, every, anywhere you have stratification or a buoyancy force, you have gravity waves. So that occurs, I'll be mostly focusing on stars today. They propagate planets, planetary atmospheres, oceans, accretion disks, even galaxy clusters. And we can learn a lot from gravity waves. We can, if we detect them, we can basically use them to measure properties of the body in which they propagate. So one of the ways we do this is through astroseismology, which I'll talk about. But gravity waves themselves can actually alter the evolution of stars. They carry energy, they carry angular momentum, so they can actually change how stars evolve. So I'll be talking about that today as well. Uh, before I move on, I want to figure out the interests of you all a little bit better. So I'm going to be mostly focusing on three subjects today. Magnetic fields inside of stars and compact objects spin rates inside of stars and spin rates of compact objects, and outbursts of massive stars. So I want to know who is interested in uh, the magnetic fields inside of stars. Who's most interested in that? OK, maybe about a third or half. How about spin rates? OK, how about pre-supernova outbursts, massive stars? OK, a lot of people just said that. OK, so I'll try to get to all three of them. Um, but it's a lot to cover in one talk, so we'll get started. OK, so like I said, gravity waves are very common, especially inside of stars. One of the reasons is anytime you have a radiative region of a star, you tend to have gravity waves that propagate there. So this is a nice simulation of the sun done by Lucy Alphan. So you see the outer convective layers of the sun inside in the radiative core of the sun. We still see all the structure that's due to gravity waves propagating in that part of the star. Uh, this is a nice simulation of convective carbon shell burning, maybe about 10 or 100 years before the collapse of a massive star. This is a simulation done by Andrea Cristini. But now it's not working, it's working before. Uh, so what we see here is vigorous convection here, and that actually excites waves. These are gravity waves above and below this convective burning shell. And these waves actually carry a lot of energy in this case. And I'll talk about some of the consequences those can have for massive stars. So first I want to talk about magnetic fields and something I like to call magnetoastroseismology, uh, which is an important subject because even though we can measure magnetic fields near the surfaces of stars, historically we've basically never been able to measure magnetic fields inside of stars. So we don't know the magnetic field strengths that exist inside of stars even to zero order. I'd say. We really don't know what to expect. So if we can detect them some way, we'll learn a lot. OK, so the work I'm going to tell, about you, tell you about now is done in large part in collaboration with Matteo Cantiello, who's now at CCA. And all the data you're going to see was uh, provided by Dennis Stello. He's a really great astroseismologist in Australia. Uh, OK, so the way we do astroseismology is you basically take beautiful light curve like this. This is a Kepler light curve. It's essentially four years continuous data 
at, you know, 100 parts per million kind of accuracies uh, for four years. And so there's an enormous amount of structure here. Uh, what we see is these sort of long-term uh, bumps and wiggles. This is actually due to spots moving across the surface of the star. The astroseismic signal is actually contained in the short-term variability, which you can't see on this plot. This is not noise. This is actually pulsations of the star and granulation of the star. So what you do is you take a light curve like this. You essentially just take a Fourier transform. And then you see an enormous amount of structure pop up. And this structure is due to pulsation modes of the star. So you'll see that each one of these peaks, so each one of these is a different pulsation mode of the star. They're labeled with a number. This number indicates the spherical harmonic, so basically the angular shape of the pulsation associated with each one of these pulsation modes. So these largest peaks are labeled with one. These are called dipole oscillation modes. So these are spherical harmonic L equal one pulsations. Uh, the peaks labeled zero, these are radial pulsation modes. That's where the whole surface is moving radially in and out. And then the smaller peaks are quadrupole oscillation modes, so that's the star squishing back and forth. And then we can barely detect octopal modes and basically nothing after that. Okay, so what we actually learn from a power spectrum like this is, is quite a lot. There's two important frequencies that we measure that are really useful. The first is called new max. That's basically just the frequency at which this whole thing is centered. And these are pulsations excited by convection at the surface of the star. That convection right near the surface reaches almost sonic velocities. So the characteristic eddy turnover time of convection near the surface is the characteristic pulsation frequency. That scales like sound speed over scale height, which scales uh, with your stellar surface gravity divided by temperature, square root of temperature. So that sets the frequency. So if we measure this frequency, we get, basically get a measurement of the surface gravity of the star. Okay, the second important frequency is called uh, delta nu, or the large frequency spacing. That's just the frequency spacing at which this pattern that you see repeats. Uh, that's basically given by an integral of sound speed throughout the star. This is because each, these are acoustic modes. Each one of these is one higher radial order. And so it turns out that they're separated by this basically sound speed crossing frequency. And that frequency is, you can show, it's basically just proportional to the square root of the density of the star. So if you measure nu max and delta nu, you get a measure of gravity and density. Those are both those functions of m and r. So if you measure both of those, you basically can solve for the mass and radius of the star. So this has been one of the revolutions provided by astroseismology. It's the ability to measure precise masses and radii for thousands of stars at a time. Okay, so that's really great, but we can also learn something about the physics of stars as well. And in this talk, I'm going to mostly focus on red giant stars, and the structure is really important. So similar to the sun, which has a convective envelope and a radiative core, red giants also have a radiative core surrounded by a much larger convective envelope. And the, con the radiative core in the red giant case is basically like a helium white dwarf embedded in this extremely large convective envelope. But it turns out we get incredibly useful information about this white dwarf sized core and the pulsations we see. And the reason for that can be understood from this propagation diagram. So to understand the signal that you get from master seismology, it's useful to think of the pulsation modes as being composed of waves that are propagating the surface of the star into its interior and back outwards. Okay, so this is the dispersion relation for waves propagating in a star. It's dependent on three frequencies. The first is the wave frequency, omega. The second is the lamb frequency, which is basically a sound speed crossing time over local radius. That's this red dashed line on this plot. The third important frequency is uh, n, the brunt by solid frequency or the buoyancy frequency. That's basically a measure of buoyancy inside of the star. If you take a fluid element and try to displace it radially, it will want to oscillate up and down at the buoyancy frequency. So that's positive in the radiative core of a star. It's essentially zero in the uh, convective envelope. So at the wave frequencies we observe in red giants, we have this interesting hierarchy, where at the surface, the wave frequency is much larger than both the brunt and lamb frequencies, and that means this dispersion relation 
reduces to that of sound waves. So that's why we basically see acoustic modes associated with the envelope of the star. Uh, but in the core of the star, this frequency is much smaller than the Brunton lamb frequencies. In that case, the dispersion rela relation reduces to this dispersion relation for gravity waves. Okay, so what this means is that the modes we see in a red giant have this mixed mode character. They are essentially composed of acoustic waves that sound the surface layers of the star, and gravity waves that propagate into the deep interior. And it turns out the waves in these stars spend much more time propagating uh, in this radiative core, even though it's smaller, their velocities are so small there. They spend much more time propagating in the radiative core, so we actually get better information about the radiative core in a lot of ways than we do about the surface layers of the star. So you can visualize that by looking at the path that a ray or a wave would take as it travels through the star. And so for a red giant, it would look something like this. So the, these paths have this almost radial motion in the surface layers where there are acoustic waves, and then this tightly wound spiral pattern in the core where the gravity waves. So that's what's going on in these stars. Okay, so what do we actually learn from seeing these mixed modes? So this is an example of a pulsation spectrum like the one before, but zoomed in. So what we see is that this is a pulsation mode associated with uh, one of those acoustic modes of the red giants. And you can see that this acoustic mode is split actually into a triplet. That's due to the rotation of the star, which I'll come back to. Um, but in addition, we have these secondary mixed mode peaks that are separated by some period spacing between this frequency and this frequency. That period spacing basically gives us a measure of the stratification inside the core of the star. We see that most prominently for the dipole modes. Those are the ones that give us the most information about the core of the star. Okay, so over the last several years, a mystery had been emerging, which was the fact that in most of these stars, we see these very prominent dipole modes. Those are the ones colored red in this plot. Uh, but in some stars, the dipole modes are essentially just absent. They are suppressed relative to the other modes. So we still see the radial and quadrupole modes, which are the blue and black peaks here. The dipole modes are just gone. And that's very strange. But like I said, it's the dipole modes that are telling us about the core of the star, for the most part. So that suggests that it's something in the core of the star that's going on. And it turns out these stars are actually quite common. If you just plot basically the dipole mode power relative to the radial mode power, you see two very clear branches of of stars. Uh, so this is each one of these points on this plot is a different star. Uh, and these are stars that have evolved further up the red giant branch. These are stars lower on the red giant branch. So we see there are normal stars, and there's this clearly separate branch of stars with suppressed type modes. So something's going on in those stars. And the idea we had is that maybe something in those stars is somehow damping out the waves that propagate in there. Since dipole modes propagate as gravity waves in the core, if you damp out that gravity wave, you'll reduce the amplitude of the mode. And you can calculate how much by basically assuming there's an extra damping term in the energy equation for the modes. And that damping rate, the rate at which a mode would be losing energy, is basically the amount of energy contained in this acoustic cavity near the surface of the star. Okay, that's E here. Times the fraction of the wave that propagates through this evanescent boundary here into the core of the star. That's this transmission coefficient squared. Okay, and the wave loses that much energy every two sound crossing times of this envelope because it has to propagate uh, to the surface and then back. So that's the energy damping, right? We can calculate what this transmission coefficient is. It's just given by the structure of the star. Okay, so now we basically have an altered energy equation for our modes where we have this extra damping term here in addition to the normal damping term. And the assumption is the modes are still excited at the surface in the same way as they were before. So what we can do is solve for this uh, suppressed mode energy relative to a normal mode. And that gives us basically a visibility or a power of the suppressed mode relative to a mode without this extra damping. 
And it's given by this nice, simple analytic expression. What's also nice about this expression, there are no free parameters here. We can calculate this transmission coefficient, we can measure this large frequency spacing, and we can measure the radial mode lifetime, which is this, this gamma factor here. Okay, so we can take this prediction, and if you plot it on top of the data here, you see a beautiful match. Uh, and again, no free parameters, so that's really striking match. And so I think this is very convincing evidence that whatever's going on in the cores of these stars here is causing any wave which propagates into the core of the star to be dissipated almost entirely. Okay, so that's what we think is going on. What I think is producing that dissipation is, as you can guess, it's magnetic fields. They're in effect called the magnetic, I like to call it the magnetic greenhouse effect. So the idea is that there are strong magnetic fields in the cores of these stars that alter the waves. Okay, so the reason that happens is if you add in a magnetic field, uh, there are now tension, magnetic tension, restoring forces that try to resist the motion of the wave. So if you re-derive a dispersion relation for uh, magnetically altered gravity waves, you get this nasty expression here. The point uh, of showing this equation is that we have this term under the square root, and the second term here is the one produced by the magnetic field. You can see it's proportional to alpha and speed squared. So as the magnetic field becomes larger, this term becomes larger, and eventually it becomes larger than one, and so this term under the square root is negative. That means the wave number is now complex. What that means is that the waves essentially become evanescent when they hit this uh, strong magnetic field. That means they can't propagate in anymore. They have to turn and go back out. And you can calculate the magnetic field at which this happens basically given by this simple analytic expression, depends on the wave frequency and the front by solid frequency. So if we have magnetic fields larger than this critical limit, we expect this magnetic greenhouse effect to occur. Uh, it's easy to think about why magnetic forces alter waves. Let me let's do a little demo here. So if you think about a magnetic field line embedded in the gas, in the radial direction, which I'll say is up, so we have some magnetic field in the radial direction. What gravity waves try to do is they produce basically horizontal motion. So they produce shearing motion like this when they propagate through the gas. That means this magnetic field is getting bent back and forth. So you can imagine if this magnetic field is strong, it'll act like a really strong spring. It'll produce these stiff uh, magnetic tension restoring forces that will re resist that wave of motion. And so the wave won't be able to bend a magnetic field line uh, if the magnetic field is strong. So that's what produces this effect. So when the wave actually hits the magnetic field, what happens is quite interesting. This is some nice work done by Daniel Lake on Inc. So he both analytically calculated what should happen and simulated it. And that's what's shown in these plots. This is his analytic theory. This is what he saw in his simulation. They're almost an exact match. So what happens in this simulation is he has gravity waves that propagate down, they hit the strong magnetic field. When they hit it, they have to reflect essentially and come back up. But what actually happens is these downward propagating waves, when they hit the magnetic field, they're actually not really reflected, they're really converted into an alpha like wave. That alpha N wave, when it propagates back up into the star, its wave number has to increase. And it turns out that its wave number will actually diverge at a finite height. So what that means, and that's what you see at these dashed lines here, whenever a wave number diverges, that means you have basically infinite shear or compression in some part of the star. And that will cause the wave to damp out. So in general, this process, once the gravity waves hit this magnetic field, they're converted into alpha waves, which will then damp out. So that will allow this whole process of mode suppression to occur. Sorry, so what is the microscopic? So in this case, yeah, my guess is it would be some sort of reconnection. Uh, all we did in this calculation, this is just an idealized calculation, so we don't have reconnection or anything like that in there. But in the ideal case, the wave number goes to infinity, and so any kind of reconnection damping rate will, will become very large. So. I think it's a safe bet that the waves will dissipate exactly the mechanism 
not clear. Probably either reconnection or even viscosity might be able to do it. Is there enough energy injection to alter the structure of the star in some way? In red giants like these, no. The wave powers are pretty puny. Uh, they could potentially alter rotation rates because gravity waves carry angular momentum. Uh, I'll come back to when wave power alters the structure of the star at the end. I think for these stars, it's a very small effect. Yeah, they don't have to worry about uh, greenhouse warming uh, causing some sort of catastrophic effect on the star. Okay, so you can calculate this critical magnetic field strength you need for this to happen as a function of radius in your star. Uh, that's what's shown by this black line here. You can see there's a sharp minimum right here at the hydrogen burning shell. That's due to the fact that right at this sharp minimum, there's a sharp peak in the brunt by solid frequency. So that produces a sharp minimum in the magnetic field strength you need. And in red giants, that's typically of order 10 to the 5 gauss. So if you have a 10 to the 5 gauss field there, it will this magnetic greenhouse process will happen. So the other interesting thing that the data is telling us for these stars is that whether or not you see suppressed dipole modes indicative of magnetic fields is a strong function of stellar mass. So for sun-like stars, we see this effect in basically 0% of red giants. So this never happens in the descendants of sun-like stars. But it's very common, we see it in about 50 to 60% of stars above one and a half solar masses. So there's a couple, of, so that's really interesting clue as to the origin of these magnetic fields. There's a couple differences between these kinds of stars, but one of the most important differences is that these slightly more massive stars all had convective cores and were rapidly rotating when they were on the main sequence. Okay, so what we think is the origin of these magnetic fields is a convective core dynamo that operated during the main sequence evolution uh, in the progenitors of these red giants. And there's been lots of uh, theories, for instance, the simulation by Claude Augustin, which show that you can have powerful magnetic dynamos in these uh, core convective regions of these stars. The implication of this work is that the magnetic fields are able to survive into later phases of stellar evolution, even after the convection disappears. So I like to call these skeleton fields as opposed to fossil fields. They're fields that were produced during the main sequence life of the star and have been able to survive into the post-main sequence. Okay, so are the fields strong enough? I think the answer is yes. Uh, for the convective core dynamos on the main sequence, we might expect a magnetic field, and this is what the simulations show, similar to the equip basically an equipartition with the kinetic energy of the convective motions. That gives you a magnetic field of order 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 gauss on the main sequence. If that magnetic flux is conserved when the core contracts after the main sequence, we expect magnetic fields 10 to the 6 or 10 to the 7 gauss. And that's strong enough to produce this magnetic suppression effect. So I think that's what's going on. Uh, I think that most of these stars probably have strong magnetic fields in these cores. And, and their cores in these stars up here do not have strong magnetic fields. Uh, so there's some interesting implications. One is that if these magnetic fields have survived in this far into stellar evolution, they might be able to survive even into the white dwarf phase. We're still working on that idea. Uh, in more massive stars, which also have convective uh, cores on the main sequence, maybe the magnetic fields produced can survive all the way into the neutron star phase of evolution. In that case, if you just conserve flux from the main sequence to a neutron star, the kinds of field strengths you expect are order 10 to the 15 gauss. This might be a way to produce some magnetars. Uh, I said we don't see this effect in the descendants of sun-like stars. We don't know what the magnetic field is like in the core of the sun, but we think it probably has to be less than about a kilogauss, because if stars like the sun have stronger fields, those should, give, should be strong enough in the red giant phase to produce this effect, which we don't see. So probably stars like the sun tend to have fairly weak or sub kilogauss fields in their cores. I also want to say that it's not totally clear that magnetic fields is producing suppression in all these stars. Any effect that damps waves on the cores of the stars can give you a similar observational signature. So this interpretation has been challenged 
by Benoit Moser, who has claimed that in these stars you still see some evidence for mixed modes, uh, which can't exist, exist if there's a strong magnetic field. So I don't agree with this uh, interpretation, but there is a chance that some of these stars don't have magnetic fields and that there's something else going on. Yeah? So why is it that we don't see many objects in the transition? Do you have a sense of that? Like why yeah. aren't there stars with fields similar to the critical field, but not way yeah. over or way under? Yeah, good question. So what I like about the mechanism I propose is it's basically an on-off effect. If the magnetic field is larger than this critical value, the effect will occur. If it's below that amplitude, the effect won't occur. So you either have suppression or not. It's hard to get anything in between. Maybe if you fine tune the field to have exactly the right field strength, you'll get partial suppression of the waves. Uh, and maybe that's producing some of these interlopers in here. Although I think most of these are just slightly more noisy stars. Um, that's, that's what Dennis has, has told us, is that most of these stars just look like they have higher levels of noise. Um, yeah, so it's, it would take fine tuning to produce stars in this gap, and that's why I think they're rare. Yeah, sure. Basic question. You showed this nice plot earlier of at fixed mass, you still see a bimodality. Yes. So that seems also a little odd. Yeah, why isn't this number 100% or 0%? Yeah, exactly. yeah. yeah, so that, that's one of the mysteries that persists. Why do we only see this in some stars? I don't have the answer to that. Um, one possibility is that the magnetic field generated by the dynamo is only stable sometimes in some field configurations. So sometimes maybe the field becomes unstable and basically unwinds uh, and reconnects and dissipates. Um, and maybe sometimes it's able to survive. Maybe you need rapid rotation. None of these mechanisms is extremely, is a, is a satisfying explanation to me, but it's something we're still puzzled about. Okay. So I want to now talk briefly about some work I'm currently doing on rotation rates inside of stars and the kind of rotation rates we might expect a uh, compact object progeny of these stars to have. So this is a work done with Tony Pyro, Adam Germain, and a student of mine, Lin Hao Ma, uh, who worked with me this summer. So the idea here is we don't sort of similar to magnetic fields to zeroth order. We used to not know what the rotation rates were like inside of stars. We can measure rotation rates at the surface. But measuring rotates inside of stars is important because as stars evolve, their cores tend to contract. And if angular momentum is conserved, they'll spin up. Uh, and the surface layers expand. So if angular momentum is conserved, those layers will spin slower. So the stars will naturally generate a lot of shear as they evolve. And the question is, how much coupling is there between these inner rapidly rotating layers, these outer slowly rotating layers? Because that's going to be really important for, for breaking the spin of the core uh, and slowing it down to the rates we're now starting to observe inside of red giants and white force and things like that. So that coupling mechanism is still not understood, but that's what I've been working on here. Okay, so. Again, going back to the asteroid seismology, the reason we've been able to make a lot of progress on this is that now we have core rotation rates of red giant stars. So now we can actually measure the rotation rates inside the core of the star. You do that from this rotational splitting of the modes in this power spectrum. What we see here is a mode that's mostly trapped in the envelope of the star, and this is a mode that's mostly trapped in the core of the star, and you can see that the rotational splitting here is actually larger than it is here. So that immediately tells us the core of the star is rotating faster than the surface. And it turns out, when you crunch the numbers, this indicates that the core of this star is rotating something like 10 times faster than the surface. Okay, so we can actually measure that for many stars. It turns out it's easier to measure the core rotation rate than the surface rotation rate. Uh, and this are, these are some of the results from Benoit Moser. We say on the red giant branch, the stars we've been able to measure have core rotation periods something like 10 to 20 days. On the clump, something more like 100 days is typical. So I said the core rotates faster than the surface, but it actually rotates much slower than we expected. Uh, 
if you run a stellar model, including only uh, hydrodynamic instabilities that produce some coupling between the core and the envelope, you expect the core rotation rate to evolve along this purple line. So as the star evolves up the red giant branch, its core is contracting, should be spinning up, so the rotation period should be going down. The measurements are up here. So a model with only hydrodynamic instabilities gets the answer wrong by a factor of almost 1,000. Okay, so, uh, so these models are clearly excluded. The next best guess at what's producing angular momentum transport is a mechanism called the Taylor Sprout Dynamo. This is a process based on an instability called the Taylor instability, which is a magnetic instability, which I'll talk about in a, in a minute. So there's a nice paper by Hank Sprout uh, trying to come up with a prescription for how much angular momentum transport this instability should create. And when you put that into a stellar model, you get this red line, which still misses the data by roughly one order of magnitude. So the stars are spinning even slower than this optimistic uh, coupling mechanism predicted. So this is what Mateo showed in a paper a few years ago. So we need something even more efficient than this Taylor Sprout Dynamo. So the explanation I've been working on is that the Taylor instability does occur in these stars, but it actually saturates in a different manner than predicted by Sprout. Uh, what I find is that the instability should be able to grow up to larger amplitudes, uh, and so you actually get more torque than Sprout predicted. So he predicted the effective um, angular momentum diffusivity produced by this instability should scale uh, like this. And the important thing is it should scale according to his calculations like rotation rate divided by run by solid frequency to the fourth power. Uh, this ratio in red giants is something like 10 to the minus 3 or 10 to the minus 4. So you have this huge suppression factor produced by the fact that there's strong step stratification in these stars and that prevents any radial motion produced by the instability that really suppresses angular momentum and transport. Uh, in the updated prescription I've been working on, you get a similar uh, <coughs> viscosity, except now this uh, suppression is only omega over n to the squared power. So you get much more viscosity in this updated prescription. Uh, so what I've done is, well, so first derive, I can explain the microphysics of how you get this, but I'm going to skip over it in the interest of time. You can then take this prescription, put it into a stellar model, and you'll find a much better agreement with data. So this is a stellar model, 1.6 solar masses evolved from the main sequence to the white dwarf phase. Uh, the blue line is the rotation period at the surface of this model. So as the star ascends the red giant branch, the surface rotation period becomes very large. Uh, the black line is the core rotation period that you get, just including the Taylor Sprout instability as prescribed previously. Like I said, that misses the actual observations by about a factor of 10. Uh, the red line is the core rotation rate predicted by this new uh, prescription. And as you can see, it roughly matches the rotation periods in the cores of red giant stars that we measured for stars on the red giant branch on the clump and also typical rotation rates for white dwarfs, which are of order a couple days. So this mechanism uh, matches the data much better, and so I think it's quite promising. Uh, like I said, it roughly, measured, roughly matches white dwarf rotation rates. So previous predictions, all the rotation rates were, were way down here. Most white dwarfs are rotating at periods of a few days. Uh, so much better match. So it's not perfect. You can see there's this, so the red points of the model, blue points are white dwarf rotation rates we measured. There is this population of more rapidly rotating white dwarfs, which I'm not sure how to explain right now. Uh, but there are lots of effects not included in these models, binaries, things like that. Okay. So the next thing we did, we obviously, we had this prescription. We wanted to see what it predicted for rotation rates of compact objects. So if you put this, and I want to say this is still very preliminary, uh, working on a paper right now, but some of these numbers could shift a little bit. But I think we're fairly confident in them now. If you put uh, this prescription into a massive star model, the kinds of rotation periods we expect for the neutron stars, assuming this is what's setting their rotation rates, are of order 100 to 200 milliseconds typically, slightly 
faster rotation rates for more massive stars. So that's, those are the kinds of rotation rates this model is predicting. And there are a lot of young neutron stars that have rotation rates of order 100 milliseconds that appears to be a fairly typical birth uh, spin period. There are some, like the Crab Pulsar, that was born faster. Um, and again, so you could get that from more massive stars. Or I think another important effect is um, there are stochastic angular momentum transport processes that can occur uh, in the final stages of stellar evolution and also during the neutron star birth itself. So during the explosion, you can basically get a stochastic kick that torques the neutron star, affects its rotation a bit. That could actually be, those kinds of stochastic processes might actually be very important for spinning the star up a little bit right at the end of evolution. Um, but we expect generally slow rotation for neutron stars Similar for black holes, so what we did is calculate similar models, assume all of the angular momentum in the healing core of the star is accreted into the black hole, and typical dimensionless spins for black holes from these models are of order 10 to the minus two. Very small dimensionless spins predicted by these models. That might be consistent with what we're seeing from LIGO data thus far. So LIGO can measure the effective spins, basically the spin in the uh, with direction and the orbital angular momentum. Uh, and most of those spins are consistent with zero, which is roughly what we're predicting. So this might be the explanation for why mo most of the LIGO spins are slow. Yeah, Vikram. Jim, what were those uh, velocities in the previous ones? Uh, so these velocities, so these are surface rotation rates of our star. What you can see is that the final rotation rate is very insensitive to the initial rotation rate of our star. Yes. So the, the reason for yeah. mutation of black holes is kind of there are almost yep. What would be the progenitors? There almost certainly is a population of massive stars with rapidly rotating cores when they collapse. Now that population is rare, right? Those events are very rare. So what I think is that rapid rotation is uncommon. Where it would be binary. Yeah. So yeah, I think the most likely explanation is some kind of binary process. So maybe you have a tight binary and that spins up the helium core much faster to the rotation rate. So we've just run single star models. Yeah, you can get things like tidal spin up, which gives you much more angular momentum and much faster rotating core. I don't, yeah, I don't have the explanation, but that, that would be my guess at this point. Okay, so the postdictions are that black holes, neutron stars, and white dwarfs should all rotate slowly if this is the dominant process. Uh, setting their rotation rates. So if there's nothing else going on inside of the star, we expect very, rota very slow rotation rates. Yes, and as Avi just pointed out, where do the rapidly rotating magnetars and black holes come from? Maybe binaries. Okay, any questions on this before I move on? So again, this is preliminary. Um, this has not been published yet. It's about to be submitted, but uh, hopefully it'll go through. <laughs> okay, so last subject of the day, outbursts from massive stars. This is some work I've done over the last couple of years, which is mo motivated by the fact that in a lot of supernovae, we appear to be seeing evidence for some sort of outbursts or enhanced mass loss in the final years or decades of the star's life. Um, so a lot of that evidence comes from early, if you catch a supernova early, you can see signs of interaction of the supernova ejecta with circumstellar uh, material that's very close to the photosphere of the progenitor star. Um, in some cases, we've seen these outbursts directly. So this is a light curve of the progenitor of supernova 2009 IP, which we have going back something like uh, several years before the supernova. And you can see these eruptions that were occurring in the final years of the star's life, and then the actual supernova, well, debated supernova events that occurred here. So we think these outbursts occur, but there's no reason theoretically to expect these outbursts to occur in the last few years or few decades of the star's life. These stars live for something like 10 million years. Why should these outbursts occur right at the very end of the star's life? Uh, the previous expectation was there's not really any information um, 
It's propagated between the cores of these stars, which are evolving on very short time scales at the end of their lives, and the surface of the stars. Um, but I think waves might be the answer for how to explain this coupling. Okay, and again, like I said, convection is really important here because convection is one of the effects inside of a star that can excite gravity waves. And at the end of a massive star's life, the convection associated with nuclear burning becomes extremely vigorous. Uh, the convective energy fluxes in the cores of massive stars can be on the order of 10 to the 9 to 10 to the 12 L sun in the final years of its life. Uh, so I'll go through some of those numbers in a second. But the kind of wave power we expect is a small fraction of basically the convective power. Uh, we expect roughly the amount of power going into waves should scale like the Mach number of the convection times the luminosity of the convection. Now Mach, convective Mach numbers in stellar cores are generally very small, uh, typically of order 10 to the minus 3. So only a very small fraction of wave power uh, of the convective energy flux is converted into waves. So this effect in most stars is negligible. But at the end of a massive star's life, we get this interesting inversion of time scales. So what happens is the core becomes neutrino cooled at the end of a massive star's life. That means the core is basically evolving uh, on a neutrino cooling time scale. And so the nuclear burning time scale becomes orders of magnitude shorter than the thermal time scale of the envelope of the star. So it's basically evolving at its own rate. And that means that the burning, the nuclear burning luminosities in the core of the star can be orders of magnitude larger than the surface luminosity of the star. Because all the nuclear power is just going out through neutrinos. It's not diffusing out as photons through the star. So that means you can have situations where even though the wave power is only a small fraction of the nuclear burning power, it can be much larger than the surface luminosity of the star. So if those waves can propagate from the core of the star to the surface, they'll have a big impact. And so, and that those waves can transport energy quite fast. Unlike photons, which have to diffuse over thermal time, the waves can propagate outwards on the dynamical time of the star, which can be of order of days or months for these stars. So they can carry their energy out quite, quite efficiently. Okay, so the kinds of numbers we're looking at is in a typical, say, 15 solar mass star, we expect neon oxygen luminosities, burning luminosities of order 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10 L sun, Mach numbers of order 10 to the minus 2, so we're looking at wave powers of order 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8 L sun. That's a lot of power, that's, you know, 100 or 1,000 times Eddington, so if these waves get to the surface of the star, it's going to be important. The total amount of power put into waves integrated over the final years of evolution is of order 10 to the 47, 10 to the 48 hertz. That's comparable to, say, the binding energy of a red supergiant envelope. So again, these waves will have an effect if they can get out there. So the picture here is sort of the opposite of what we saw for the red giants I was telling you about a minute ago. Instead of waves excited at the surface and going in, we have waves excited in the core as gravity waves, and they have to tunnel out into the envelope as acoustic waves. If they just damp inside the core, they're not going to make much of an effect because their energy is smaller than the binding energy of the core, so they'll just puff it up a little bit, and not much will happen. If they make it closer to the surface, it's going to be a pretty, pretty big effect. Okay, so what I've been trying to do is put these wave, put this wave power into stellar models, and then evolve them. So this is a propagation diagram for a red supergiant, similar to what I showed you before for a low mass uh, red giant, except now we have waves excited, say, at the oxygen burning convective zone in the core, there's gravity waves in the core, and then they see some evanescent region which they have to tunnel through in order to make it out toward the surface of the star, the acoustic waves. So what I've been doing, and I'm gonna have to go through this really fast, but at the end, is basically try to account for all these effects, how much of the wave power makes it through that evanescent zone, whether or not neutrinos damp the waves, um, where the waves actually damp once they make it into the envelope. So I do all that, I put that all into the models, uh, and here's some of the results. So typical wave powers that I'm calculating getting to the envelope of the star are, like I said, on the order of 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7 L sun in this particular model. Uh, 
which is a small fraction of the burning luminosity, but much larger than the surface luminosity, which is this red line. And what you see is when wave powers first start to become very large, we're seeing an effect on the surface luminosity of the star. Uh, the total wave energy deposited in, in the envelope layers of these models are, there's some uncertainty in the amount of power just put into waves in the first place. Green is our fiducial model. The point is that the wave energies deposited in, deposited in the envelope are of order 10 to the 48 ergs by the end of the evolution, and that's comparable to the binding energy, which is that black dashed line in the envelope. So they'll, they're sort of just able to unbind or start to unbind the envelope before the star dies. Okay, so an important thing though is that at least in a red supergiant, the waves don't make it up to the surface of the star before they damp. They tend to damp basically at the boundary between the helium core of the star and the hydrogen envelope. The reason for that is that the density, which is this red dashed line, falls by about a factor of a million between the dense helium core and the puffy hydrogen envelope. That causes the waves to damp either by shock formation or by diffusion somewhere basically at this interface. So that's where the heat will be deposited. So that's still far below the photosphere of the star. But what actually happens, so I was gonna show you a fancy Mesa model, I'm gonna skip over it. What happens in these models is the wave heat is deposited maybe at 10 R sun down near the core of the star. And so much heat is deposited that it actually increases the pressure of that region enough to excite an, a pressure pulse or an acoustic pulse that then travels out towards the envelope of the star. And that's what these colored lines are showing. So these are velocity profiles of this model at different times. And you see this acoustic pulse marching out towards the envelope. When it reaches the surface layers, it reaches a Mach number of order one in these models. So it produces a weak shock near the surface of the star. And that shock helps uh, increase the entropy of the material and start to unbind it and lift it up. So I call this a, a pressure wave breakout instead of a shock wave breakout. So it's Mach number of order one. And what happens in these models is when that shock wave or pressure wave breaks out, we get a change in the temperature of the star and the star starts puffing up a bit. So we'd expect some photometric modulation associated with that. And if you look at the path one of these stars takes in an HR diagram, we see it basically until the last year of its evolution, it's just sitting right here. And then this, pre this pressure wave breaks out at the surface, so we get significant evolution in the HR diagram, which none of this would occur if we didn't put in these wave heating effects. Uh, so it's a factor, this particular model varies by a factor of a few in luminosity in the final year of stellar evolution. But I would say there's a lot of uncertainty associated with that. Again, because this whole process is proportional to the amount of power we put into waves which I think we know to order of magnitude, but there is significant uncertainty in what the value actually is. So what actually happens in these models after neon burning and into oxygen burning is quite interesting. So this is a density profile of this stellar model. It's a 1D model of a 3D star mapped into 2D in this movie. And what actually happens at the end of evolution here, so now we're about uh, less than a year before collapse, what's actually happening is the wave power is all being deposited just outside of the core of the star, and it's so powerful that it's actually lifting material off the core of the star. It's inflating this bubble, which is then expanding into the uh, convective envelope of the star. So that's what happens in this 1D model. Now in reality, we have this low density material trying to lift up this higher density envelope, what will happen in multi-D is that will become Rayleigh-Taylor unstable, and so we'll get these uh, Rayleigh-Taylor plumes, which will affect the envelope of the star. And that's something I've just started talking with Paul Duffel about. He's just run some very preliminary simulations showing that that Ray Rayleigh-Taylor um, instability develops. But what we want to know is if those plumes will actually break out of the surface of the star and inject material and things like that. So that's ongoing work. Uh, I've also done some very preliminary work with Tony Pyro, looking at the light, how the supernova light curve will be affected by this process. Uh, to first order, what we expect, so solid lines are models run with the wave heating, dashed lines are models without the wave heating. 
the first order, what happens is the star is a little bit larger radius. So that means for a type 2p supernova, it's a slightly brighter, slightly longer lasting uh, supernova light curve. But we still have a lot to do in terms of understanding how this will actually affect details of a supernova light curve. Okay, last thing I want to mention, if this process occurs in a star uh, without a big, thick hydrogen envelope, like say a type 1b progenitor, which has almost no hydrogen, then the waves are again damping at the edge of the helium core, but now that's actually near the photosphere. So in this case, what can happen, and now the wave heat flux is very super Eddington. So in these cases, what we find is the waves actually drive this very dense super Eddington wind off the surface of the star. The mass loss rates in that wind from the models I've run can be of order 10 to the minus one solar masses per year. And that can eject this helium rich material out into the CSM. And I think this is a good way to potentially produce uh, these type 1bn supernovae, which are supernovae that show signs of interaction with circumstellar helium. I think this might be one way to get that helium out there. Okay, final thing I wanna say, uh, this effect is interesting, but probably doesn't occur in all stars. And part of the reason for that is that I think in many stars, the waves will become nonlinear. Uh, this is an effect which I have not included in the models I've run thus far. Uh, but the point is, if you look at the wave amplitude times the wave number in the core of the star, uh, the typical numbers you get are much greater than unity. What this means is the waves will become significantly nonlinear in the core of the star. And the calculations I've done are for linear wave propagation. These nonlinear waves will probably mostly dissipate in the core of the star. That will suppress the amount of energy that they transport outwards. So this process may be suppressed in many stars, especially those with thick helium shells, helium, convective helium envelope, um, convective helium burning shells, because uh, those present basically a big barrier to waves getting out. But there are some kinds of stars, like this particular model, has no convective helium burning shell. The waves have a very thin evanescent region. They can get out much more easily. So I think there are probably some stars in which this effect is very pronounced, like this kind of star. Other stars where it's not. So one of my next phases is to look at a population of stars, figure out which ones are most prone to these outbursts. There's been some nice pre-supernova imaging showing intense outbursts are not happening for all stars. So probably this, uh, this whole process only happens in some subset of, of massive stars. Okay, so I think this is a good way to maybe produce some of these flash ionized type 2p supernova, maybe type 1bn supernovae, but these waves are not powerful enough to unbind 10 solar masses of material and give us the most luminous type 2n supernovae. Uh, there are probably other effects that produce those kinds of supernovae. Okay, so that's everything I wanted to say. Thank you. All right, great. So uh, do we have some additional questions for our speaker? Poppy? So it, it sounds to me the central engine here in the, in the last segment uh, mm -hmm. does not know so much about binding energy of the envelope. That's so, right. so how, why, why is it fine-tuned to just give the right amount of energy? Or is it not? Oh, why, so why was the wave energy well, comparable to the coming from? I think it's just a coincidence. Uh -huh. uh, now that was sort of specific to that model. I think it will vary depending on different models. So for instance, the stars without this thick uh, hydrogen envelope, their, their surface or their envelope binding energy is extremely tiny. There basically is no envelope. So in that case, the wave energy is, is much larger than the envelope binding energy, and so it just ejects the entire envelope, and in that case it just drives a steady wind. But you're absolutely right, the wave power doesn't know about the surface binding energy, and so you can get different effects depending on the ratio of wave energy to binding energy. So, do you expect any effect from earlier burning phases, like carbon, you know, core carbon burning, not enough to maybe blow off an envelope, but enough energy deposition to actually affect the luminosity of the star at all? Uh, yeah, I think it's a very small effect, but potentially, especially carbon shell burning, uh, and also helium shell burning. Uh, the reason I think those are important, so previous phases, there's just not enough energy 
percent of the star's luminosity or something. But carbon shell burning um, gets there's potentially enough power to maybe double the star's luminosity or something like that. So that'll be a significant effect. I am like mostly focused on where the wave power, you know, is 100 times the star's luminosity and the effect is shorter lived but more pronounced. I have put in, I have included carbon shell burning in the models. The ones I've run such thus far, it's a small perturbation, but there might be certain stars where it's a bigger effect. I have not put in the helium, waves excited by the helium burning convective shell. Those can be important because, again, they're excited up here. They also see a very thin evanescent region, so their power much more readily escapes to the surface. But even like a 10% change in luminosity is definitely measurable. And if the time scales are a thousand times longer, yeah. you've got a much larger population of... Yeah, so it, I agree. And I think that's something I'd like to, to work on. Now, if you just make your star 1% brighter in the last 100 years, I don't know how we'd measure that. Um, or say 10% brighter. I'm not sh Like, we could measure it, but how we distinguish it from all your other variable massive stars, I'm not sure. Uh, but it could also do things like increase the luminosity a little bit, and that might increase the mass loss rates substantially. So I think there's lots of effects like that that have yet to be explored. Add that to that title again. Of course. Um, the, that event where you say you can launch the shell of helium off, yep. is that something that would be observable too? Like if you yeah, I feel like the O9MD so. thing. Let's and, see. And how bright do you think it would be? Yeah. Yep, so that's in my paper from this year, okay. which I think I have some slides buried deeply in here. Uh, but the luminosities during outburst of the models I've run are of order 10 to the 6 L sun. That increases the star's luminosity by about a factor of 10. Uh, so that's definitely detectable. Uh, we should be able to see that if we saw the pretenders in one of those events. Um, the kinds of wind speeds we get are a few hundred kilometers per second. Let's see, I'm getting there. Okay. Okay, so this is one of those models. So this is wind speed. You can see the terminal velocity in these models is a few hundred kilometers per second. That's over a time scale of a, a year, a few years. You can get material out to something like 10 to the 15 centimeters. That's about right. What? That's about what you need for one of the ends. Um, and you don't you don't want material going out too far, because then the interaction will occur too late. And of course. It, interaction, the material doesn't get up far enough, the interaction gets swamped at early times, only occurs at early times. So, so the numbers are about right for 1BN, so I think it's a promising explanation for this. So uh, Jim will be around today and tomorrow if you, if you have further questions, but in the interest of time, since you're giving another talk, let's, let's call it quits for now, let's thank our speaker again. Thanks. Thank you. I did mention
Griffin, we're talking tomorrow, yeah? Yeah. Okay, we can talk more about the one at the end. Yeah, exactly. All, All right. right. <laughs> Look at your paper. Okay.